Father, we bless you and we honor you on this great day that you have allowed us to be a part of. As we now enter into this preaching and teaching occasion, we pray that God that you give us clarity that you will speak to us as you speak through me. I ask, oh dear Lord, that you would make your word so very clear and so very plain through this flawed and frail instrument. I submit to submit my body to you, my mind, my vocal cords, my gift, everything that I have, I give to you. And say, use me, O Lord, to your divine glory, that your name might be magnified, that your children might be edified. As we work toward being sanctified, and that the enemy in hell will be glorified as Christ Jesus is glorified. We love you, thank you, bless you, we honor you. Now let the me inside of me sit down, the you inside of me rise up. And you go forth to deliver this message in the mighty master's name of Jesus, who will be this Christ. And together, everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Good morning, church. This indeed is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. I just have one question. Is there at least one person who's excited about being in God's house this morning? Come on now, you can be very sweet and good for me. God will come to the heaven. Amen. It was so good to see you all. Amen. Your lovely, wonderful, smiling faces. It's been a couple weeks, and this is the first time in 14 years of pastoring this church that I have missed two Sundays consecutively. And I love this job. Amen. So I'm happy to see you. I'm glad that you held it down while I was gone. Uh, you know how to do it. Amen. Because we are a mature church. Amen. It's not about who's standing in the pulpit preaching. Uh, you still come and support the work of the Lord. So thank you for being mature. And bringing that these last couple of weeks. I want to now invite us, if you would be so kind, to turn with me to an Old Testament passage found in the book of Daniel. If you would turn to the book of Daniel. Amen. The old saying says, when the cat is away, the mouse will play. Somebody will play with my sound system. Yeah, somebody touch some buttons up there for this ain't sound. Amen. Be good, Pastor. Be good. Amen. The book of Daniel. Everybody, everybody back to your point of finger saying, I didn't touch it. Y'all doing what Adam and Eve did. And, uh, God asked Adam and says, What have you done? Eve made the fruit. God said, Adam, what have you done? God said, It was the woman you gave me. Adam pointed the finger at God. He pointed the finger at Eve. Eve pointed the finger at the snake. The snake didn't have us put the stand on. Hey, um, we're going to turn to the book of Daniel. Unlike is our custom and tradition, I'm not going to have you stand uh, because I'm not going to focus on one specific verse or select verses. I am going to make reference to this first chapter period. Uh, so don't even worry about uh, identifying one uh, group, one specific passage or group. I'm going to make reference to the chapter. So uh, if you would, for those who are taking notes and like to document uh, what we are preaching and teaching, I want to simply use as a topic today, uh, I'm going to let you choose. You choose which one you like best. I like just 21 days as a topic, as a title, 21 days. But for those of you who would like to choose a different topic, title, you can choose 21 days to your next breakthrough. Amen. 21 days to your next breakthrough. Whichever one you choose, it's the same thing. Amen. Amen. 
Out of this collection of sacred writings in both the Hebrew scripture, what most of us refer to as the Old Testament, that of the New Testament, it is filled with a plethora of biblical stories, references, characters, personalities, and yes, narratives. And amidst all of these, these personalities, these characters, these stories, we are introduced to a plethora of ideas, concepts, lessons, uh, philosophies, etc., etc. And out of those numerous characters, there uh, are individuals that seem to stand out sometimes a little bit more than others. There are some stories even that catch our attention uh, even more than, than others might. And one story and or one group of characters in particular is that of this young man by the name of Daniel and his friends uh, that accompanied him. You know the story, of course, we read where King Nebuchadnezzar had gone to uh, Judea and it was there that he had chosen uh, select uh, individuals who were, were good to look upon, who were smart, who were intelligent, who were gifted and talented in science and such. And it was there that he would go and recruit. No, not necessarily recruit, but that he would go and that he would take captive these choice young men. And out of all these young boys that he took uh, for his own personal purposes that he would groom and one day use to advance his cause, there were four young men that stood out amongst all of the others that had been taken into captivity. You know them as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, but most formally, the three uh, boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their names are actually Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their, that's their Judean name. That's their, that's their Jewish name, if you will. It was the, uh, the, the Babylonian name that we start uh, referencing and or that we most identify these three boys. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, is these, these, these names that are actually associated with uh, these Babylonian gods. Yeah. So they changed their names. These uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which we really changed, they changed their names. But these, these four young men, there was something very special about these four young men. And it was, it was, introduced to us because of the stance that young Daniel took. Y'all stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. It was a stance that young Daniel took because when he was confronted with what was presented to him by the king by way of the eunuch, it was there that Daniel remembered who he was and where he came from. And if I can just stop parenthetically for a moment there, I want to put a challenge out there, my brothers and my sisters. I want to put a word out there that unfortunately when it comes to children of God in this day and age in which we live, there are so many who forget who they are and forget where they come from. Yeah. As, as children of God, we, we represent the Most High. As disciples of Christ, we are supposed to be uh, representatives and ambassadors of and for Christ. But so many of us have forgotten who we are and where we come from. But that was not the case with young Daniel and his three uh, partners. Uh, no, they, these young men knew exactly who they were and where they came from, and they knew what they had been taught and what they had been trained. If I can just throw this in parenthetically for just for a brief moment, I'm speaking now specifically to some parent who is worried about their children and their children's future. Why? Because their, their children perhaps have chosen to go down a, 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 a path that is contrary, or that is contrary to how you've raised them and how you've taught them and how you have uh, reared them. 
And so your, your, your concern, and, and rightfully so, as parents, I promise you that is definitely something uh, that causes us to stay up late at night many times is when it comes to our children. We worry sometimes about our children and we wonder what is going to happen with them and their lives. So I understand. But it was interesting to note that these young men who were taken into captivity, they had been trained and raised the right way. They have been brought up the right way. And so really their parents, though they were worried and concerned because their kids had been taken into captivity, there was really nothing to worry about because they had given them what they needed to be successful and to survive. I'm speaking to some parent here today, as long as you've done your job as a parent, you've raised them up. The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. As long as you have done your due diligence in raising them up and instilling and imparting in them the word of God and teaching them the truths of God to it and to fear and to it and admonish his teachers, you have nothing to worry about. Are y'all hearing me on today? I know from the surface that may not sound like much comfort, but it ought to be uh, all the comfort that you need to know that God has got your back, and he not only does he have your back, he's got their back as well. Preach your master Sanders. But it's on us to train them and to teach them as they are growing. So I'm speaking to some parent here who has given their children the choice, the ability to choose whether or not they come to church and participate in church functions and activities and choose whether or not they pray or read their Bible. I'm not suggesting that we force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. But as young children, amen, it is our responsibility to cultivate their minds and to craft them, help mold them, amen, um, as they are growing up because they don't have the cognitive ability to make many of those choices for themselves. And so we, at minimal, ought to at least coach them and cultivate their minds. Are y'all hearing me on today? And so we ought to. It is a responsibility. As a matter of fact, it is an act of neglect if we don't do that. You see, because there comes a time, there comes a point in time your children grow up, and when they grow up, they go out of your presence. But even though they go out of your presence, as long as God is in their life, he will always be presently involved and engaged in the affairs of their life. But it starts with us teaching and training them while they're young. Just like we teach them to brush their teeth in the morning and in the evening. Just like we teach them to wash and bathe. Just like we teach them to put on clean undergarments. As we teach them to take care of themselves and we teach them the importance of education, etc., 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 it is also important, as a matter of fact, it's even more important that we teach them about the word and the ways of God. Yeah. So don't be guilty of neglect when it comes to your children's spirituality. But watch this. Watch this. Their parents didn't really have much to worry about because they had done their job. They did their due diligence. So as these young boys are away, it really was now time to put to test that which has been put inside of them. Okay. There will come a point in time in your life where that which is inside of you will be tested and will be tried. We all talk about faith and we all, you know, say we have faith and we live by faith and we walk by faith and all that. But you really don't know what your faith is about until your faith is tested, until your faith is tried. It's not until your money is funny and your change is strange and your credit just don't get it that you understand and realize, amen, what faith is all about when you don't know how your next bill is going to come about. When you don't know how that bill is going to be paid. When you don't know what's going to happen because your finances are not as stable and secure as you want them to be and need them to be. It is not until that you have gone to the doctor's office and up until that point you have been able to boast about a good bill of health that it is now that the physician has told you that you have a condition and or a situation that uh, has presented some complications and either you're going to be on medication or treatments for the rest of your life and or you're going to have to live with a condition 
for the rest of your life that is uncurable and or correctable. It is not until then that your faith that has been um, instilled inside of you, it's not until then that it has been put to the test that you know what faith is all about. These young boys have now been put in a position where they had to implement that which has been installed and that which has been imparted to them. And so as they are now there, look what happens. The king gives orders that everyone, all these captives, would eat uh, his delicacies. His meat, his wine, and so on and so forth. He wanted them to be fit. He wanted them to be sharp. So he, he granted and gave to them so that they might eat, uh, amen, the best of the best. He wanted these young minds to be sharp. But it was there that we discovered something about Daniel. We discovered something about these three, um, amen, friends of his. We discovered that they had a commitment to something and to someone that was far greater and higher than themselves. And it was over a process of first 10 days, but in totality of 21 days that we discovered not only what they were made of, but who was making them and to who they were supposed to be. You know, here we are today. It was 21 days to the next breakthrough. It was 21 days um, in which they would then uh, be put into the spotlight where, where, where mankind, where humanity was able to see who God really was in their lives and what he was doing. And I stopped by my way to heaven today to challenge someone for the next 21 days to make a change in your life. To put yourself in a position where God can work in you, where God can work on you, and where God can work through you. Amen. Amen. I, want, I, want, I want to put a challenge out there for someone here today. You have a big decision that you need to make in your life. It's a major decision that could change your life. It could change the, your destiny. It could change the tra tra trajectory of your life. It could change everything and you need to make a decision that is so important you ought not make it casually you ought not make it unadvisedly you ought not make it without having a man some some spiritual discernment and some spiritual guidance you have a decision to make and i want to invite you i want to challenge you that over a process and period of 21 days that you consecrate yourself before the lord that you spend some time hearing from God so you know what God wants for your life. We, 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 we talk all this talk, there's now urban colloquialism about being the best version of ourselves, living your best life and so on and so forth. But if you're gonna live your best life, you're gonna be the best that you can. If you're gonna be the best that God has destined, designed for your life, then you ought to take some time where you disconnect from others and you connect to the Lord Amen. and hear what he is saying Amen. so you know what he is doing. Are you hearing me today? That's what Daniel did. And part, that's what he and his partners did is that they went through a 21-day process whereby after those 21 days had ended, they were a new, a new person. They were they were refreshed. And they have, and, and they were rejuvenated. God was able to do something through them that changed history. Watch this. A couple things that I noticed that if we are up to these twenty one days of working towards our next best breakthrough, then the first thing that we ought to pay attention to is the sacred commitment. The sacred commitment. They made a sacred commitment. I'm going to tell you why they made a sacred commitment because I told you that they were introduced to the king's food. Watch this. It says, out of these young men, I told you how awesome they were. In verse 4, it says, these young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace. Watch this and whom they might teach the language and literature, literature of the Chaldeans, all right? These are the, um, these are the boys, amen. In verse five, it says, and the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wines which he drank. <clears throat> this was what the king had drank himself. And three years of training for them so that 
at the end of that time they might serve before the king. I told you that the king had captured these young boys for his personal pleasures and personal benefit. He was going to use them um, for his advancement. So it says, now from among those of the sons of uh, Judah were Daniel, Hanani, Michelle, and Azariah. And to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, uh, and to um, Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azra, Abednego. Yeah. I noticed that not only did he present to them these foods, these delicacies, but he changed their name. But it's interesting to know what happened. It says, with Daniel in verse 8, Proposed to his in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor the wine which he drank. Let's stop right there. I told you that I noticed a sacred commitment. Daniel had made a sacred commitment along with his three friends. They made this decision that they made to not partake and eat of the king's food and drink because of a sacred commitment. Okay, some of you are looking at me and wondering, okay, what does that really mean, Pastor? Well, what it means is this, watch this. It wasn't just the food. We know that Jewish um, culture, um, they adhere to strict dietary laws. There's certain things that they don't eat. They don't eat swine. And they don't eat shellfish and eat different things that are considered to be unclean. So it was bigger. It was different. It was separate from just their dietary restrictions. You have to understand that these meats and these, and these foods that the king was presenting and offering to these young boys was food that had first been dedicated and devoted to the idol god. Yeah, to the pagan gods. They, they sacrificed these foods up and dedicated these foods to the idol gods before consuming. And so, and so, and so Daniel, being true to his God, says, no, Amen. we're not going to partake and eat of something that was unsacred. Not only might it be unclean because of the dietary laws or restrictions, but this is not sacred because it has been offered unto idol gods. Watch this. And to make matters worse, they changed their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? These names were Babylonian names that were uh, giving tribute to Babylonian gods, Baal, and such. Mm. And I told you that these boys, these were, these were, these were special boys. These boys remembered who they were and they remembered where they came from. And they said, because of who we are and because of where we come from and because of who we represent, we will not allow ourselves to be defiled. So what am I saying to you today? I'm saying to you today that my brothers and my sisters as Christians, as believers, as children of God, we ought not allow ourselves to be defiled. We ought not partake and, and associate with that and those things which are unholy, especially those things that have been dedicated and devoted to gods of this world. Amen. There was one in true living and loving God. That is El Shaddai. That is Jehovah. That is El Shaddai. That is Yahweh. That is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the God of great grandma and big mama and them. That is the God of the Bible to whom we serve and to whom we worship and to whom we honor. We ought not succumb and we ought not serve and subject ourselves to the ways of some lowercase idol God. These young boys said we refuse to do that. They said, we have a sacred commitment. It was a sacred commitment to God and God's ways. Come here and ask you a question. Have you made a sacred commitment? Have you and are you willing to say no to this and to that because of your sacred commitment to him? Don't answer out loud. But you ought to answer that question. Is, 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 am, I, am I devoted, am I dedicated to the God that I say that I serve? And so Daniel says, no, we're not going to defile ourselves. And so after Daniel said that, you got to see what happens next. It says the chief of the unit gave names, after he gave names, and, and, and Daniel said, no, we ain't going to do this. 
He says, now God had brought Daniel into the favor of the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Watch this. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, he says, look, Daniel, I hear what you're saying. And that's all Gucci and everything. He says, but um, I fear my Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. He says, so for, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. This is what the guard said. The guard said, look at here, man. We cool and all that. He says, you know, I, I, I like you, Daniel. You ain't, you, you, you ain't like these other cats. He says, we good. He says, but you got to understand. If I don't give you what the king has said to give you, he says, it's going to affect the way that you look and affect the way that you live. As a matter of fact, he says, you're going to be looking bad and stuff because you eat scraps and, and, and the king is giving you the best. And, and all these other cats that show age, they're going to be looking, you know, plump and prosperous and what have you. They're going to be looking all skinny and frail. He said, then the king going to come ask me what's going on. And that's going to cost me my job and maybe cost me my life. He says, but you good and all. He says, but I fear the Lord King. Amen. I fear Nebuchadnezzar. He says, so I ain't willing to do all that. He says, I, I like you. He said, you cool in the fan. He said, but I'm about to put my life at risk and in jeopardy. Watch what Daniel says. Verse 11, so Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Azariah, he says, he says, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. He says, then let our appearance be examined before you. And then the appearance, the appearance of the young men uh, who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you can, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. He says, look here, man. He says, all right, put us to the test. If after 10 days, if we don't look better than those who've been eating the king's stuff, he says, then do with us whatever you please. How you see fit, he says, handle us accordingly. He says, but after 10 days of us eating vegetables and water, and after the 10 days of them eating what the king has, he says, take a look at us and examine between the two. So I told you, first of all, I see it. I notice the sacred commitment. But second of all, I notice a sanctified challenge, a sanctification challenge. There was a, a sanctification challenge. You know sanctification. Sanctification that uh, being distinct. And so he says, compare us to the others and see that there is not a difference because of our sacred commitment. What I noticed, my brothers and my sisters, in the sanctification challenge is that God will use you, watch this, to set you apart. They were set apart, and as a result of them being set apart, watch this, they stood out. And because, watch this, they stood out, they stood up. Amen. Amen. And it was really that they stood out and that they were set apart because they stood up. They stood up to the king. And they stood up to the ways of the world. See, so many of us, we assimilate. And we become a part of this world. The Bible says you are of this world, uh, but be not like this world. Amen. You, you may live here, but you ain't got to be like the world. Amen. You are a part of the kingdom of God. You are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Yeah. And so many of us think that we just have to give in and succumb to the ways of the world. But that's not how you were made. That's not how you were designed. You were designed, my brothers and my sisters, to be set apart, to be distinct and distinguished. You were designed to be a one who stands out because you are willing to stand up. Come here and let me ask you a question. In this day and age where everyone is going with the flow, where everyone seems to be giving in to the ways of the world and ways of the government and ways of society and giving in to the, what seems to be the norms, are you willing to stand out and stand up that which is righteous and that which is holy? We are set apart. Young people, you ain't got to do what everybody else seems to be doing. Be, be, be sold out. And watch this, to be sold out for the kingdom does not make you a sellout. Preach, Pastor Sanders. 
They stood out because they were set apart and because they stood up. It's about integrity. You know, these words we don't use anymore, seemingly. It's about integrity. It's about ethics. It's about values. It's about morals. Oh, oh, oh. These are the things that, that we as children of God ought to honor in order to incorporate into our everyday decision making. It is in our lifestyles and our day to day walk. My brothers and my sisters, I see that Daniel uh, and his and his boys, they, 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 they had given themselves to the sanctification challenge. They said, we are not going to blend in and we are going to stand out and we're going to step out on faith. We know that God is going to honor our decision to be holy and sanctified. So no, we're not going to eat that stuff that's been sacrificed and has been, has been submitted to bed. And these, and these pagan gods, we want to stay true to our God. And we know that God is going to make us healthy. Amen. Watch this. So it goes on. So in verse 14, he consented with them in this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. Watch this. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. Then all the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacies. And in verse 16 it says, So thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wines that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Yeah. At the end of those 10 days, he looked at them, he says, Man, they look better than the cats that's been eating what the king is giving them. They, they're, they're fairer and they're fatter and, and there's something that's flowing about them and all they have eaten was vegetables and water. So he says, y'all proved yourself. He says, so that's what y'all want to eat? That's what I'm going to give you. And so it says in verse 17, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So I know it's a sacred commitment. I know it's a sanctification challenge. But thirdly and lastly, I know this spiritual clarity. Amen. Amen. Spiritual clarity. So, so, so here's what I'm really trying to 